pathophysiology. Who can tell me what pathophysiology means? Study of the disease process. For those of you that take, you know, just the regular anatomy and physiology or the biology department, you're looking at a healthy human body. You're just looking at it kind of in black and white. In pathophysiology, we're looking at the disease process in the body. So we kind of have a different focus here. So in order to do a good assessment on a patient and get a good differential diagnosis, and we'll talk about what that means uh, later on, a good differential diagnosis, you've got to have an understanding of the disease process. How do we get to this point? So that you can recognize signs and symptoms. So we'll, that's the kind of stuff we're going to be talking about here tonight. We're going to look briefly at the cell, the cellular metabolism. There's not a whole lot that I'm going to expect you to know about that. I'll tell you the few things that I want you to know. Um, if you go up in the program, if you go on, you'll take A and P, 1 and 2. Uh, they'll get into this a little bit more deeply particularly at the advanced level, because pathophysiology takes on a whole new meaning. But at our level, not so much. We're going to look at the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, as part of the disease process. Perfusion, hypoperfusion, and shock. Those have confused some people, I think. And we're going to look at disruptive physiology of major body systems. So if you get a disruption or a problem, say, with the pancreas, what what's the uh, impact of that on the body and that sort of thing. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Pathos means what? Disease. And we already know what ology means, right? Yeah, so we've got the study of, of disease, disease process in the body. Ta -da. Good work. Okay, that's close enough. We need to know this so we can understand and recognize the changes that a patient goes through as we try to do an assessment. All right, the cell, let's see. Who can tell me what the mitochondria does in the cell? That's the powerhouse. Yep, that's the powerhouse. That's what creates the energy to drive our body. That's the main thing that uh, probably need to know about this. Cell membranes are, are semi-permeable. Uh, they can move stuff in and move stuff out. They'll be important when we look at things like sepsis. Sepsis is going to be a widespread uh, infection in the body, and a lot of things go on as a result of that. ATP. Can I tell what that means? Sounds like what? Yeah, adenosine triphosphate. Uh, ATP is going to be the energy that's actually created by the cell. The mitochondria convert glucose and other stuff into ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That's energy. One of the medications that we give at the upper levels is adenosine. And we give that uh, for people with an interesting cardiac rhythm. So it's part of this too. ATP is fuel for the cells, as I said. If we don't have that fuel for the cells, then everything slows down dramatically. Uh, it's got to have some ATP in order for the cells to function. Without the ATP, the, uh, the heart can't contract. You know, the muscles can't do what they're supposed to do. It's a big problem. Okay. In the cell, the cell requires several things. Cells require water. What are the other things that it requires? I've already talked about most of them. Glucose, yeah. It's got to have oxygen. So those are three things that are just typically required by the cell. If you get too much water in the cell, <coughs> it's going to fill up and pop like a giant water balloon. If you don't have enough in the cell, it's going to shrink down and dehydrate and that's going to damage the cell to the point that it can't, uh, can't function. So we don't want too much water, we don't want too little water. There's a nice happy balance in there. The amount of water that you have in your system also has an impact on your electrolytes. You know what electrolytes are? What kind of what they do? Gatorade. Yeah. Gatorade. But the electrolytes are what uh, helps the electrical functioning throughout our body. We don't have proper electrolytes. You know, you start getting cramps. You know, you got to go drink some Gatorade and you get leg cramps. Uh, if you don't have the right balance of electrolytes, your heart's not going to contract. You've got to have calcium, magnesium, some of those other uh, 
elements in order for the heart to work properly. Oxygen in the cell. Y'all know the difference between aerobic metabolism and anaerobic metabolism? Some of you, you may not have seen that since the ninth grade. But it's very important to the functioning of the cells and the efficiency of the cells. Anaerobic, this word actually means with oxygen. Aerobic, I say it wrong? Anaerobic. Aerobic means with oxygen. You know, if you go and do aerobics, you know, where you're exercising, then that uh, is using and requiring a lot of oxygen. So aerobic metabolism is going to be metabolism that occurs in the presence of oxygen. And that's much more efficient for the cell if it's got a proper amount of oxygen. So if you've got some good oxygen, your cells are able to create up to 36 moles, that's M-O-L-E, 36 moles of energy. That's good. That's about what we want our cells to be producing. That sounds really nice, doesn't it? Anaerobic, which really is almost like the opposite, this is going to be cellular metabolism in the absence of oxygen. The body can do some metabolism if it doesn't have oxygen. It's not a good state. It's not very efficient. When it doesn't have oxygen, it's only going to create approximately two moles of energy. Is that a huge difference? That's a huge difference. If I'm having to do work, like climbing the steps, you know, doing things, walking around up here, I need all of my 36 moles. This is not going to do it for me, two moles. So that's a huge difference. We, all, we need to make sure, whenever possible, our, our patient has adequate oxygen so that their cells can work properly. So that's one of the things we're looking at when you have a patient that is hypoxic. They're not getting enough oxygen. All of a sudden their cells are switching from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism. Very unhealthy for them. With anaerobic metabolism, the body creates and produces a lot of uh, nasty byproducts. A lot of acid is created and builds up in the tissues. You know how it is when you're working really hard. If you're out you know, running a marathon or something, you're just huffing and puffing. You're not getting enough air in. You may start feeling that little muscle burn in there where you're starting to build up a little bit of acid, where you're not getting quite enough oxygen in there. And you may, some of your cells might switch to anaerobic metabolism and build up a little bit more acid in there. So you may actually feel some of that burn. The body becomes acidic, and that's not a good place to be. Uh, if you become too acidic, uh, you'll have too much carbon dioxide uh, dissolved in your blood, and it's not a good state for your cells. So, did that tell you anything you didn't already know? Probably not. Here's just an example of aerobic metabolism and anaerobic metabolism. I don't know, I'm not a picture person, so this is hard for me. How many, where are our picture people? You look at this and you're going, yeah, I get that. I have to look at it and see what it's trying to say. Here is our cell in the presence of oxygen and glucose. And I guess there's some water in here. We're going to create a good amount of ATP. How much are we creating? 36 moles. Here with anaerobic, we've got oxygen. We've got some water. I mean, we've got glucose, but no oxygen. So what is produced here is going to be pyruvic acid, which turns into lactic acid, which is what's that nasty burn that we get. So how much uh, energy are we going to get produced here? Two. About two moles, yeah. See, that was simple. It wasn't too bad. Okay, I mentioned a few minutes ago about the cell membrane being permeable, or semi-permeable. And it's going to change sometimes based on the disease state. Some diseases or disorders. Uh, for example, I mentioned sepsis, but uh, a severe allergic reaction would be another example where the permeability of the cells change, and that's where we get edema. You know, if you get stung and you notice it swells up really bad, you're getting a change in the cellular permeability around that area. And so they may actually take on more fluid. It draws more fluid to the area too. So a lot of, uh, that's gonna have a, a big impact on the fluid content in your body uh, based on the permeability of the cell membrane. Negatively impacts the membrane's ability to transfer fluids, electrolytes, and other substances in and out. 
you don't need to know a whole lot about that right now, but just recognize that cellular permeability it has a big impact on our disease state sometimes. Okay. Part of this, well, you, it may allow toxins to enter the cell, and now we've, we've got a big problem once that occurs. Okay, y'all ready to move into the systems? That's all the cell stuff, all right? Good for you. The cardiopulmonary system, heart and lungs. We said the other day that the respiratory uh, system and the cardiac system have to work together, right? Remember we talked about the fluid and the pumps and what else? Fluid and the pump, <coughs> fluid and the pump, the pipes. I'm not with me tonight, I can tell. All that stuff can work, but if you're not getting oxygen in, it doesn't do any good. If you got a lung problem, you got a blocked airway, if everything else works, it doesn't matter if you can't get air in. So they're going to work together to bring oxygen in the body, spread it throughout the body, distribute it to the cells. Another point, uh, another aspect of that is going to be, uh, as the other part of perfusion, it's going to be moving waste products out. How do we get rid of most uh, byproducts of metabolism? through the skin, but the vast majority of it we're going to get rid of through respiration. Uh, any breakdown can result in system failure. Right. Any problem with cardiac, any problem with the, uh, the lungs can wreck the whole system. Okay, you need to know the composition of ambient air. What in the heck is ambient air? Sounds like it's going to poison us, doesn't it? Ambient air? Anybody? Room air. Yeah, room air. Ambient is the stuff around you. Like we might talk about ambient temperature. The ambient temperature in here is probably what? 70? You think it's 75. The girls think it's 65. Yeah. Ambient temperature is what's around you. So ambient air is what's around us. So in the air that we just typically breathe is approximately 21% oxygen, approximately 79% nitrogen, a teeny tiny bit of other things, but for the most part we're looking at nitrogen and oxygen. And these are rounded. Oxygen actually is, you know, 20 point something or another. And this is at sea level, and that's going to change a little bit as you go higher in elevation. Okay, we talked about how the airway works the other night, right? Just, we just did A and P, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Talked about the larynx. What are the two major cartilages that make up the larynx? Yeah, and which one is on top? The other one. Who has the other one? The thyroid. thyroid, correct. Thyroid, and then uh, this one was what? Thyroid. Thyroid, yeah. So what goes in the middle? The, um, this little space right there? Thyroid membrane. Yeah, so that makes it easy. It's kind of like a contraction, isn't it? Um, this is the trachea through here. What's the point where it breaks into? We call it, what is this place called? The place where it splits. Starts with a C. Oh, I'm going to have to start taking better notes. Who has it? Man, I got some sleepy heads in here. The point where this breaks in two is called the carina. Y'all said it the other night. Y'all act like you never heard it before? Who's never heard that before? Okay, good. So I said it the other night. 
Um, what do we call this where it splits, the B word? Bifurcate. Yeah, bifurcation. The bifurcation. So where I say, what do we call this uh, place where the trachea bifurcates? You'll say? Carina. Carina, yeah. When I say, what do you call that where it splits in two? You'll say bifurcation, right? We've just like tripled our vocabulary. Shocking. Okay, what else do we have on here? Hey, I have a question for you. Stop me if we've already been over this, which I think we probably have. Uh, look at the way this, the bifur after the point of bifurcation, this branch kind of goes up higher and this one goes down lower. Huh? Yeah, the heart's in here. So it pushes that branch up. So you can see that if uh, somebody chokes on something and it gets past the trachea, I mean past the larynx and comes down, say it's a marble. Which one of these is it more likely to go in? This picture isn't, it's a little bit more severe than that. Which one of those is it going to roll into? The right. The right. You know, we talk about that at the upper level with the paramedic students. When they're intubating, they put the tube in here. If they put the tube in too far, they're more than likely going to have what we call a right stem intubation because it goes just right down that track. <coughs> it's much more difficult to get it into the left track because of the way it goes. So if you, somebody chucks on something, they aspirate it, it's more than likely going to end up over on the right side. Y'all good with all that? Now you can see that as these bronchi, uh, each one as they get smaller and smaller and smaller, their names, they, now it's a uh, bronchial as it gets to the terminal end. And then at the very end, which is not drawn here, what are those? Alveoli, that's right. However you want to say it. Right, where's my things? Y'all okay with all that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, move on, lady. Okay, here's the alveoli. Uh, important parts about the alveoli, if you'll see, they look like little round balls. They look like clusters of small grapes. But you can see that the capillary beds wrap all around here. This is where gas exchange occurs. And if you'll see, there's smooth muscle wrapped all around here also. This is smooth muscle that wraps around here. I think I mentioned this uh, before. If you have a severe asthma attack or they get, uh, you get something nasty in your lungs, one of the responses of the body is to tighten up these muscles. So they don't want that nasty stuff down in the lungs. So it's going to tighten up and squeeze that. Same thing happens here. It kind of tightens that down. Well, once that happens, what happens in the body? What's the result of this? Not enough yeah. You can't breathe. All the gum muscles have tightened down. Yeah, you have a hard time, a harder time with gas exchange because of that. That's why you take something like albuterol. That's a smooth muscle relaxant. So what it'll do is help these guys loosen up so you get better airflow through there. See what you've learned tonight? Isn't that great? Okay, anything else I need to tell you here? Oh, I think we got that. Okay, more uh, definitions here. Patent. Your patient must have a patent airway. And patent means that it's open. It's like I've got a hose that I water my garden with. And as long as water can freely flow through it, it's patent. But when I drive over it with my car and leave my tire clamped right down on it, I don't have a patent hose anymore. Nothing can flow through there because I've clamped it down. So your patient has to have a patent airway in order to move oxygen and carbon dioxide in and out of the body. So patent is a key word there. Patient may have an upper airway obstruction. When we talk about an upper airway obstruction, we're talking about above the larynx. So an upper airway obstruction might be swelling, the epiglottis swelling. It could be, when well, I say above the larynx, the larynx or above. Uh, if uh, you've got swelling in the larynx or you've choked on something that's stuck in the larynx, that would be an upper airway obstruction. It could be from a foreign body, it could be an infection, it could be an injury from trauma. But upper, upper airway obstructions are very common. And you can recognize an upper airway obstruction usually by the sound. If a person's breathing, you kind of hear this 
this tight sound, you'll hear it right through here. Or you may hear something we call strider. And it's kind of a high-pitched, squeaky sound. And if you put your stethoscope over this area, you would hear it very clearly as an upper airway. Um, can you think of an example of a lower airway lung sound? Do you have any asthmatics in here? Do you have family members who are asthmatic? What would be that lower airway sound? Wheezy. Yeah, that wheezy. That's a lower airway sound. So when you auscultate, remember auscultate means to listen. So if you auscultate the lungs, then you'll hear that deep lower airway sound. So you're going to have to be able to identify whether it's an upper airway sound or lower airway sound. If it's upper airway, then we'll worry about something blocking that part. Maybe a choking maneuver would clear that. Mm. Maybe not. Or if it's a lower airway sound, uh, more times than not, we can't do a whole lot about that. Okay, the lungs. All right, the lungs are considered the lower airway. So at some point, you may get a question on a test that says, which of the following is... A, a lower airway sound. And it says strider, snoring, hiccuping, wheezy. Which one would you pick? That would be wheezy, right. That's a lower airway sound. So you've got to be able to identify and assign upper or lower airway to the sound. Okay, tidal volume. Another term you need to be familiar with. Tidal volume, if you think about, I don't know, I think of the tides, you know, a big wave comes in, a big wave goes out. So tidal volume is going to be the amount of air moved in and moved out through each breath cycle. So your tidal volume is like a wave volume, in and out. That's going to be your tidal volume. In and out, that would be one breath cycle. A formula that you need to be familiar with is going to be uh, determining what a patient's minute volume is. That means how much air they move in and out in one minute. So if we can figure out what their tidal volume is, the amount of air they bring in and out, times the number of breaths they take in a minute, that's an easy one. That's an easy one. So minute volume is going to be the amount of air moved in and out times the number of breaths they take. Anybody have an idea of about how much normal tidal volume is? 500 million. Yeah, that's about average, between 400 and 600. So if you figure 500 is a good average for somebody, and what would be a normal respiratory rate? Let's go with 15, just to keep it simple. So 15 in a minute times 500 milliliters some, some math guy, figure that one out. I say math guy, that doesn't just mean males. Math people, all you math people, 15 times 50? 7,500. Is it math guy? Does that sound right? I'm not a math guy either. But I do have a way of finding out. What do you say, 15 times 500? Okay, y'all ready for this? How am I doing so far? You win the prize. For those of you that had difficulty with that math, I went on and did this long division. That's not really division. I know that. <laughs> I'm enough of a math guy to know that wasn't division. Okay. So now we kind of get an idea about how much air our patient's moving. If you looked at a patient and you could barely see their chest rise, you think they're breathing uh, 700 milliliters with each breath? Probably not. If you barely see it move, do you think they're like doing 400? Maybe. But say they're only breathing eight times a minute and you think they're taking in maybe 400. So how much air are they exchanging? What's their minute volume? Gosh, you can't even do the math. How rude. Okay, let's do that then. Watch this. What did I say? 400 times, how many did I say they were breathing? Eight. Eight. Oh, is that going to be hard? How 
how much was the other guy breathing that we did a minute ago? 7,500. Yeah, that's a big difference, isn't it? So this guy's not doing too good. What's the main problem here? Is it his volume or is it his rate? It's his rate. The volume we can live with if he's breathing, you know, 20 times a minute, right? If he's breathing 20 times a minute, how much is he exchanging? What's his minute volume? 8,000, right? Even I can do that math. I hope, is that right? Okay. <laughs> oh, stop. Okay. I get it. All right. So we okay with that so far? I make a point about this minute volume and this formula because as we move on and we start looking at respiratory disease and recognizing patients that have respiratory issues, this is a biggie. This is going to tell us if the patient's breathing adequately or inadequately. If the volume, which means you can barely see the chest rise or if there's no motion, if there's not enough volume, that'll tell us one thing, or if the rate's not good enough. So if the rate is too low or the volume's too low, or, believe it or not, you could have volume that's too high and a respiratory rate that's too high. Either one of those being out of the norm, you've got a patient that's probably not breathing adequately. And we were talking, oh, that was this morning. We didn't talk about red flags yet. But something that will really set you off is if you see that one of those things is out of the norm, you know they're breathing inadequately. Once you determine they're breathing inadequately, then you've got a problem that you've got to solve. So one of the main things we're going to be looking for is our patient breathing adequately or inadequately. And it really goes down to this formula. Whether you're not going to think of it as a formula, you're just going to think of, oh, my patient's not breathing adequately. That's okay. All right. So any change in tidal volume or rate is going to affect our minute volume, right? That's what the math we just did. Respiratory dysfunction occurs anytime something interferes with our minute volume. So if we're not exchanging enough air in a minute, then we're going to have a big problem. We've got respiratory dysfunction. How might bronchospasm impact the rate, tidal volume, or alveolar ventilation? What do you think this word means, alveolar ventilation? We know what, al we know what this word is, right? It's a derivative of what? Alveoli, that's right. So we got the alveoli, and what does this mean? Yeah, yeah, are we getting air to the alveoli? That's all that means. Sounds really big. Are we getting air to the alveoli? What could interfere with getting air to the alveoli? Or getting oxygen to the alveoli? What could interfere with that? What if I choked on bubble gum? I'm not going to get oxygen to the alveoli, right? What if I'm... Uh, what if I'm asthmatic and I've got a whole bunch of built up mucus in my lungs? Is that going to interfere with oxygen getting to my, alve to my alveoli? Sure. What if I am in a fire, heaven forbid, I'm in a fire and there's nothing but nasty toxic chemicals and carbon monoxide in there? I'm not getting oxygen down here, I'm getting carbon monoxide down here and other nasties, right? So all those things are going to interfere with alveoli ventilation. It's going to interfere with the air, oxygen actually, that actually gets to our alveoli. We know what rate is. We know what volume is. Do we know what this is? Bronchospasm? You can think that one through. We know what spasm is, right? We know spasm. What's this word? That's our bronchi. Sure. Remember that other picture I showed you, a smooth muscle wrapping around the little tubes there as they tighten, that's what a bronchospasm is. So the question is, how might a bronchospasm affect your patient's breathing rate? If it's clamped down like that, closing off that airway, what impact is that going to have on how fast your patient breathes? Are they going to breathe faster, slower, or the same? Faster. Yeah, they're going to breathe faster. I can't move as much air through there. I can't increase my volume, but I can increase my rate. Maybe I can get more air in. It's usually counterproductive, but uh, right. So it's going to cause an increase in rate if we have uh, bronchospasm. So that's one of the processes that I need you to start working on. Given something like this, you need to think about bronchospasm. Tight the muscles tighten down. 
So you can work out this like a math problem without the math. So you can figure, if you've got a patient and you listen to their lungs and you can hear <coughs> wheezing, they're breathing fast, you know that they're not moving enough volume of air, right? So they get bronchospasm. Okay, disruption of respiratory control. Now this gets kind of interesting. Now remember when we looked at the uh, anatomy and physiology of the head, we talked briefly about the medulla oblongata, didn't we? talking about three or four classes in the last couple of days, so uh, I forget who I told what. The medulla is going to be the, uh, the respiratory center of our brain. A lot of things occur uh, in the medulla oblongata, and that's right at the, the brain stem, just above C1 and C2 up there is your medulla, and that has all re pretty much the majority of the respiratory control there. So if you have a problem with a head injury that interferes with that, or if you get swelling on the brain that puts pressure on the medulla, then it's going to alter your respiratory pattern for your patient. So that's never good. Any event impacting function of the medulla can affect the minute volume, the amount of air that's processed uh, over a minute. Things that can cause that, of course, trauma, toxins, uh, infection, certain drugs, all those things can have an impact, a negative impact on the medulla. So that's not good. We'll talk about this at much greater length when we get to uh, the trauma section. What can you think of that can interfere with respiration? Now, remember the difference between respiration and ventilation, right? What's the ventilation? In and out, in and out. Uh, you can move air in and out of a patient, but you can't make them respirate. So respiration is what? It's gas exchange, exactly right. Respiration is gas exchange. If your patient is dead, you can ventilate them with a bag valve mask, but you can't make them respirate. So what can you think of that could interfere with respiration? You can cover up respiration and make that gas exchange if it's easier for you. What can interfere with gas exchange? Choking. If they've choked because no gas is getting in, no oxygen is getting in, what else can interfere? What about it? The blockage or something? It's not pumping correctly? Yeah, if you're not getting enough blood flow through the lungs, that may interfere with gas exchange. Narcotics? Yeah, if you've got narcotics, it de de uh, depresses respiration. Any type of blockage, remember I mentioned bronchospasm that was on the screen a couple of minutes ago? That would interfere with uh, respiration. So a lot of things can interfere with respiration or gas exchange. Uh, if you've lost a lot of blood, you don't have much circulating blood volume, that really could interfere with respiration. If you think of respiration as gas exchange, it can't spread the, the good gases around. Okay, disruption of pressure. Remember we talked about in the chest, we have negative pressure in the chest. So that in order for you to breathe, what's the diaphragm do? Arches. Diaphragm, it goes down. Remember its resting state. The resting state of the diaphragm is which one? Which is the resting state? This one? Good job. This is going to be the flex state. So when it drops down, when it contracts, it's going to open up your chest. If you open your mouth, the air is going to slide in because you've got negative pressure in your chest. This creates more negative pressure in your chest. Now, I want one of you guys this weekend to view this video and tell me if my drawings come up. I keep forgetting to look, so I can't remember what I drew on. Oh, that's not going to write. Okay. So if we have anything that interferes with our ability to create that negative pressure, it's going to interfere with our breathing. If you've got broken ribs, right, got really broken ribs, you're not going to be able to get negative pressure in there. If, you've, if somebody stuck a knife in your side, you're not going to be able to get negative pressure because when you go like this, like the air is going to zoom out somewhere else. It's going to suck air in. You're not going to be able to get negative pressure in there. So anything that would interfere with you get, being able to get negative pressure in there, you're not going to breathe well. So that's not good. That's going to interfere with your minute volume. 
Sometimes we actually get air and blood that accumulates in the chest. So that fills that space that we want to fill, that we want to use to create negative pressure. If I've got a bunch of blood and air in my chest, are my lungs going to be able to expand? No, that space is already taken up with something else. So that uh, creates a, a pressure issue for us. Interferes with respiration. If something damages the lung tissue, aka the alveoli, if we don't have alveoli available for gas exchange, what's going to happen? You know, you got to have air, you got to have gas exchange. So anything that interferes with the alveoli's ability to exchange gases, it's going to interfere with our breathing. If we get less oxygen in, we get less carbon dioxide out. If we, uh, low levels of oxygen, we call that hypoxia. High levels of carbon dioxide, which is the opposite, is hypercapnia. Those are words you need to know, specifically hypoxia. Hypoxia is low oxygen in the tissues. That's hypoxia. We may say a patient is hypoxic. How would we recognize a patient that was hypoxic? Yeah, they may start getting blue around the gills. What do we call that? Same word? Cyanosis. That's right. How else would you recognize that somebody maybe was getting hypoxic? Say what? Right. It might be their position. You usually will recognize that. If you see somebody, when you walk in and they're sitting up like this, <coughs> We call that tripod position. They get in that position because it takes some of the pressure off of their lungs when they lean forward. They're going to breathe a lot better. That's going to be their most optimum uh, position in order to breathe their best if they're having respiratory stress. So it may be their position. Probably one of the most common things that you'll notice is they have beginning uh, altered mental status. You know, they start getting a little bit confused or they get a little bit anxious. You know, if they're not getting enough air, uh, you'll notice that with their mental status pretty quickly, too. Okay, the next component as we look at respiratory is going to be compensation. What do you think of when you hear compensation? Money. Yeah, I think payday. It's tomorrow. Yeah, it's the end of the month. That's compensation. That means it doesn't have the exact same uh, definition when we look at respiratory compensation. But if the body's not able to get enough air in, it's going to do things to compensate for that. We talked about one of them just a minute ago when we said if you've got airway blockage or the muscles have tightened down, you've got bronchospasm, so that not enough air can move through there, what's the body going to do to make up for that? What's going to happen to the respiratory rate? It's going to increase. That's compensation. That's respiratory compensation. So in order to compensate, for low oxygen levels, the respiratory rate is going to increase. What other things might happen besides just that? You not get enough oxygen, your body starts going, oh, I'm not getting enough oxygen. So the respiratory rate goes up, but what else happens uh, vital sign wise? Your heart rate goes up. Why does your heart rate go up? Well, I'm scared to death, that's for sure. But it serves another purpose. Oh, Toby, you're trying to get What else happens here? She's going, what? She's quiet. Why else does this occur? And there's less oxygen in blood, so it's more Yep, exactly. It wants to get, is I have a lower level of oxygen, but if I move that blood around faster, then maybe I'll get more oxygen to it. So those are two compensatory mechanisms. That means methods of compensation that the body will do. So you're going to get, you'll get tachycardic. Remember what that is? Tachy means fast, particle no part. So you become tachycardic and you start breathing a lot faster, trying to make up for that. Those are compensatory mechanisms. The body attempts to compensate for the negative changes. Now we have little chemo receptors. They're like, uh, they're like, speed trap cameras, like the camera we have down here on the corner. You know we have a camera here, so don't run the red lights. So chemoreceptors are like little cameras put out there by your body. 
and they will test the blood. It's like uh, if you have a pool or a spa, you know, you always put a little dipstick in there to find out, you know, what the chemicals are like. That's what's happening here. So blood flows by, it goes by these chemoreceptors, and your body's constantly checking, oh, do we have too much carbon dioxide in this blood? Do we have too much oxygen in this blood? That's what chemoreceptors do. And once it dips in its little dipstick and sees that the carbon dioxide level is too high, which will happen if you get bronchospasm or anything that interferes with gas exchange, you're gonna get a rise in carbon dioxide in the body. And what's the body gonna do? How does the body compensate for low oxygen levels? I told you then. The heart rate goes up and the respiratory rate goes up. You guys are falling asleep with your eyes open. Shocking. Okay, so the brain, what part of the brain steps in here? The medulla, the medulla oblongata steps in and goes, hmm, problem. Increase the respiratory rate so we can get more oxygen in. It may also increase the tidal volume. How many times have you sat here being bored to death in class and you're breathing about eight times a minute, probably moving about 200 cc's with each breath, and all of a sudden you go, <sighs> does that happen very often? Your body's saying, oh my gosh, you're not giving me enough oxygen. And it's gonna increase your tidal volume. It's gonna say, we need a big breath now. That's a compensatory mechanism. Okay, y'all ready to talk about the blood, or is it break time? Yeah, let's take uh, 10 minutes, go out there, you know, do whatever you, you do out there, and come back. Refreshed and awake, please. I keep thinking y'all gonna start talking more. I'm gonna have to start pulling teeth out there. It's not that you don't know, you're scared. I think we've already done this, haven't we? The blood? He took over these selling hamburgers next week on Wednesday. I don't eat hamburgers. You might eat our hamburgers. I don't eat hamburgers. Besides, who's here in the middle of the day on Wednesday? Anybody besides me? Not a one of you. No? Fine. I saw you here today. What were you here today for? this we'll go kind of fast four parts of blood what are the formed parts red, blood, red white, white platelets, platelets and what is the unformed plasma. part plasma woohoo look at you uh, the red blood cells important part of red blood cells is they carry the hemoglobin molecule what happens on the hemoglobin molecule oxygen yes it attaches to stuff most commonly and most popular would be oxygen if it's attached to carbon monoxide is that good or bad That'd be the bad thing. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. It's not the super bad thing. Well, it is the super bad thing. White blood cells fight infection. Platelets, those are what help form clots. They break apart and uh, pour out some good stuff. What's that? 
Oh, I hate this. Plasma oncotic pressure. All right, y'all are going, oh, brother, please not that. <laughs> In our plasma, we have large proteins. And some of these large proteins, one of their functions is to pull water out of the vascular system, uh, into, or the, the interstitial space into the vascular system, and can move that back and forth. That's plasma oncotic pressure. It's going to be based on the pressure within that uh, body. And you can see right here, this is the capillary. Albumin is one of those uh, large proteins that reside within the vascular system that help move fluid, water specifically, across the membranes here. So depending on what the pressure is on either side, it's going to try to equalize. So that's what uh, onconic pressure is. Okay, hydrostatic pressure will push it back out into the bloodstream. So, onconic pressure basically pulls it into the bloodstream away from the cells. Hydrostatic pressure pushes it back out uh, in, into the bloodstream. So, onconic pressure moves it in. Hydrostatic pressure moves it out. You may have to draw a little drawing to remember that. I usually have to. If you have a problem with the proteins where you don't have enough of something like albumin, then it's going to cause an uh, imbalance and you're going to have a serious fluid imbalance. Can you think of anything that could cause you to have a severe decrease in these plasma proteins? You have to really think about this for a minute. Where do those plasma proteins reside? In the plasma. Where does the plasma reside? In the blood. So can you think of anything that could lead to a loss of these proteins? Yeah, blood loss. You're bleeding out, so you're losing, of course, all your foreign parts, which are going to include platelets, but you also are going to lose these large proteins, which are a problem because those help you retain uh, fluid volume. So it's very important. Albumin, albumin, as I mentioned just a minute ago, is one of the large proteins. These are produced in the liver, and patients with liver disease, if they're not able to produce enough of this albumin, they have a very difficult time maintaining good water balance. So consequently, it doesn't pull water into the vessels. It remains in the cells, and it's going to cause a lot of edema there. So it doesn't, they're not able to pass a lot of that fluid because it has a lack of large proteins. <coughs> so just know that your liver uh, disease patients have a major problem with edema. They can't pass that fluid for several different reasons, not just that. <coughs> hey, blood dysfunction. We know that if you have a lack of circulating blood volume, that sounds like lack of circulating blood volume. Circulating blood volume, what does that really mean? How much blood you got? Sure. So if you have a lack of circulating blood volume or not very much blood, we're going to call that hypovolemia. So if we don't have much circulating blood volume, we're not going to have much gas exchange, right? Because it doesn't get around. If we have fewer red blood cells, which could happen for a lot of different reasons, one, hypovolemia. If you don't have enough blood, you're not going to have enough red blood cells. If you don't have enough red blood cells, you can't carry enough oxygen. So it's like the cycle. If we have less water retaining proteins, then we have less fluid volume, which makes us hypovolemic too. What is one way that's very easy for you to become hypovolemic without bleeding out somewhere? This is the south. This is the summer. Sweat. You sweat all out. You get dehydrated. You're not replacing up your fluids. Then you're going to have a lack or low level of circulating blood volume. So you're not going to be transporting enough oxygen. You're not going to get enough oxygen to your cells. So then you start acting freaky. These are uh, arteries and veins. These are capillaries. Ta-da. Good work. Does it make you hungry? Looks like a nasty pretzel. OK, what else we need on here? Like this. We know where gas exchange takes place, right? Capillary beds. 
turn blood to the lungs, have to be the heart for gas exchange. So when um, when veins return blood to the heart, is it oxygenated or deoxygenated? Deoxygenated. So if it goes through the heart, where does it go? The lungs. It's going to pick up oxygen. It's going to come back and then go throughout the body, right? Okay, that's where it gets that. We have to have enough pressure in the vascular system or in the venous system and the arterial system in order to move the blood around, right? If you don't have enough blood, hypovolemia, low circulating blood volume, then you can't get oxygen to your cells. So it's never a good idea. One of the things that the body does to help this problem, to uh, try to counteract that, uh, to compensate for that is it's going to regulate the size of the vessels. If, if you vasoconstrict, vaso means what? Vessel. So this, we're talking about your vascular system. If you vasoconstrict, you know what constrict means, right? Mm -hmm. Think about it. you got a hose and you're flowing water through it. If it doesn't have an end on it, you know, it just kind of pours out nice and pleasantly. But if you crank it down with one of those shower head things, you know, all of a sudden you're constricting the flow so that, right, you, it increases the pressure, doesn't it? So in your body, if you vasoconstrict your vessels, it's going to increase the pressure because it's going to shrink up the, uh, the size. It's like, uh, this, is, this is a small drink. This is a large drink. If we pour this large drink into this smaller one, this thing is going to be full, isn't it? Now, if this wasn't in here, and I pour this amount in the small container in here, it's only going to be half full. But what the body does, it's going to constrict the vessels, it's going to make the container smaller, so that it's going to be more full all the time. Does that sound like stupid? Well, anyway. For you guys that have to have a picture of it, Oh, sorry. Oh, that's why you're laughing, because I gave away your orange. How rude. How rude. So that's one of the ways that the body compensates to keep the pressure up and makes the container smaller. It's going to vasoconstrict. So, you know, when you go outside and it's really cold in the wintertime, you know, it's like 50 degrees, really super cold out there, what happens to your fingers and your toes? They get really cold, don't they? Because you vasoconstrict, your body saying, mm -mm, I need to keep that heat. So it's going to clamp down to keep all that heat closer to the middle. So your fingers get cold. They might start getting cyanotic because we're not getting enough oxygen there. You know what another side effect is of that? If all of a sudden your body shrinks down the container size and you've got too much fluid in there, what's it going to do? No, it doesn't pop. But that fluid has to go somewhere. We got any scuba divers in here? Oh, a couple. Okay, good. You've ever gone in the cold water? You're diving with all your gear on. You're down there just about five minutes. And what's the first thing you got to do? You can say it. I know we're recording. You got to pee. You know why? Because you're shrunk down your container, but you still got too much fluid. So the kidneys start taking some of that fluid out. I guarantee it's the first thing you got to do is pee. But if you've been outside in the cold, if you ski or just go outside because you're dumb in the cold, as you vasoconstrict, you have to pee pretty quick. You know, it's like if you got little kids, you bundle them all up with all that gear to go outside. I have to pee, Mom. Oh, this one's fun. I love that. I love that So anyway, do you understand about the dilation and the constriction of blood vessels? It serves a purpose here. Now, I talked about the, the, um, the chemoreceptors a few minutes ago. And that's like a dipstick, checking the chemicals in the blood. We also have stretch receptors. They're like baroreceptors. And they check the pressure within the vessel, too. If the pressure gets real high, then it may vasodilate, which will decrease the pressure. If the pressure's low, I'm talking about blood pressure, the pressure within the vascular system, if it's low, it's going to vasoconstrict to bring the pressure up. Isn't that handy? Stretch receptors. They also won't allow overstretching of the vessel. So the pressure will be increased or decreased based on the needs of the body. There we go. Now, loss of tone. We're talking about a blood vessel. This is a very 
uh, important concept. Uh, it's a concept that's often overlooked. But loss of tone uh, is going to be when the vessel totally relaxes. For instance, right now you're sitting here. It's not like you're lifting weights or doing any major exercise. So your body is just at rest. But it hasn't lost its tone. If, it's lo if it lost its tone, you would fall out of the chair and just lay like a, you know, a puddle of water on the floor. That's total loss of tone. Does that make sense? So you still have some contraction of your muscles just to sit here. If you had a spinal injury, then everything below that injury, you may very likely have a loss of tone, meaning the vessels totally relax and totally vasodilate. That's loss of tone. As long as you're conscious like this, a normal person, you've got good tone. If you're unconscious, you'd lose your muscle tone. For instance, have you ever tried to pick, pick up somebody that was like so totally dead asleep or passed out? You try to move them and we say they're dead weight? It's because there's no contraction of the muscles at all. It's like the arms just flop out like this and you're trying to control those arms. That's a loss of muscle tone. So your vessels can do that too. You can have a loss of vascular tone where they just totally expand and lose any tone that they have. So they're not able to constrict normally. So that's never good. Remember we were talking, did the volume thing with these two size containers? This is what we're talking about here. With a normal vessel with good tone, you've got enough volume to fill your vascular system. It contracts or expands to meet your volume as necessary. When you have a loss of tone, it completely dilates, and so there's not enough volume to fill it. So what do you lose? What's your blood pressure like? It tanks. Yeah, because unless this constricts, you're going to lose your, uh, your blood pressure there. So with loss of tone, the vessels lose their ability to constrict and dilate. And the blood pressure will drop, as I said. Causes, infection is a very common cause of this. I've mentioned sepsis before. We'll talk about that later, where you have a widespread infection that goes throughout the vascular system. That can cause this. Trauma, spinal injury can cause this. A severe allergic reaction. We talk about somebody with anaphylaxis. Are you familiar with that term? Anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction, and that's one that we will be treating, and we'll be talking about this later. In those events, uh, you're going to have this loss of tone where the vessel just totally vasodilates. We talked about vasoconstrict. Vaso means vessel. Dilate or constrict is the back part of those. One of the other things that happens is a change in the cellular permeability. Remember, we talked about this earlier, permeability is the ability of fluid and other products to move across the cell membrane. So we'd like it to be normal where some things cross, but not everything. But you can have the situation where the, the uh, cells become very permeable and everything leaves the cell. So they start leaking, that's what we'll call that. They leak, and that causes the vessel to leak. The, uh, your capillaries most commonly will start leaking and give off water. We see that with a severe infection like sepsis. And there's some other things that can cause that too. And you'll see that also as a lot of edema uh, in the skin. It may also present as pulmonary edema. So edema is what? Edema is swelling caused by fluid. So that's going to be edema. If we have edema in the lungs, what have we got? Fluid in the lungs, that's right. Is that ever a good thing? Fluid in the lungs is never good. Okay, other blood vessel dysfunction. Systemic vascular resistance. That's a big term, but we know what systemic means, right? That's the system, the whole vascular system. And vascular is what? The vessels. So we know what resistance is, right? You know, you talk about, the guys talk about doing resistance training and the gym, you know, where they're lifting weights, something like that. That takes a lot of pressure to do that. So here we're talking about pressure inside the vessel. So the systemic vascular resistance, that's going to be how much resistance is created due to the size of the vessel, most commonly. But it could be due to a bunch of plaque that's built up inside the vessel, 
which is going to raise the pressure because there's not as much space in there. Remember we were just talking about space? Systemic vascular resistance. If you have high systemic vascular resistance, meaning there's a lot of pressure and a lot of stuff in there, preventing easy blood flow, what's that going to do to your blood pressure? Raise it or lower it? Or keep it the same? It's going to what? It certainly is. It's going to raise it because it's increased pressure on it. It's just like the hose I was talking about. Some conditions can lead to this uh, abnormal constriction when the vessel closes down or if it's got stuff in there. Uh, one thing that leads to that is people with hypertension, which is high blood pressure. If you're constantly, if that vessel is under a lot of pressure all the time because of high blood pressure, then you've got high systemic vascular resistance. Does that make sense? I don't know, it sounds really corny. Causes a lot of stroke and heart attack. High blood pressure, high systemic vascular resistance. Those are, they're not used interchangeably, but they essentially mean the same thing. Okay, let's talk about the heart for a minute, okay? This is stuff you probably already know, some of it. The heart pumps, right? As it does a pump like that, as it contracts and puts out a big pulse of fluid, blood, and we call that the stroke volume. That's going to be the amount of blood that the heart can send out in one, in one contraction. That's going to be stroke volume. That's going to be the output. Uh, which vessel is responsible for this output? Not vessel, but which chamber of the heart? The left, the left ventricle. That's right. So when the left <laughs> ventricle contracts, it puts out approximately 60 milliliters. You can also say cc's. 60 milliliters per contraction. So each time it contracts, it passes about 60 milliliters. That's, uh, that's a pretty good volume. How many milliliters is this? 500 and not what's So this 500 is basically, so we're talking about 60. So it's, you know, in this range, it's not a whole lot, but on each pulse, it's quite a bit, I think. Okay, stroke volume, I know this is killing you. This is just some stuff you're going to have to know. We know what the stroke is, right? The stroke is going to be the contraction of the heart. And we know what volume is, right? So what is stroke volume? the amount of blood put out with one contraction. That's going to be the stroke volume. So, with stroke volume, it's going to be based on several things. If you get plenty of blood into the heart, then the heart can do what? Pump plenty out. If you don't get much blood into the heart, how much is it going to pump out? Not so much. So, preload, you know, pre is going to be before, so this is before it gets to the heart, basically coming in on the right side. So preload is going to be the amount of blood coming into the heart. Preload. Now, contractility, what do you think that means? How hard the left ventricle pumps. That's contractility. So how, what is its ability to contract? Uh, if you've taken some uh, cardiac drugs that help decrease the contractility of the heart, patients that have had a heart attack, they may take medications to do that. It lowers the systemic vascular resistance. So contractility is how hard the heart pumps. Afterload, I think of afterload, you know, is what the heart pumps out. And that's kind of close, but really it's the pressure that's in the vessels. And the pressure is based on the amount of blood the heart pumps out. So preload and afterload are not exact mirrors of one another. Preload is the amount coming in. Afterload is going to be the pressure in the vessel, which basically is systemic vascular resistance. Okay? That wasn't too hard, was it? Do y'all want to go over this slide again? There's a resounding no. <laughs> okay, good. Now, all of that is important because we need to be able to uh, appreciate what our patient's cardiac output is. We know what cardiac is, right? The heart. And what would be the cardiac or the heart's output? It's blood volume, right? <coughs> so if our heart doesn't have any cardiac output, what, what's going to be our status? Yeah. Let me go flat line. So cardiac output is going to be based on how much blood is pumped out by the number of beats per minute. It's just like we were talking about in respiratory. It's going to be the volume times 
how many we have in a minute, right? Same thing with the heart. So it's going to be the stroke volume. What's the normal stroke volume? Talked about it a minute ago? 60. 60. Yes, about 60 uh, milliliters with every stroke. And then how many times it beats? So say, say our stroke volume is 50. Because I know how you guys are. We need a nice round number. For me, probably anyway. So if our stroke volume is 50, because we're at rest, and what would be a normal uh, beat per minute? How many beats per minute is normal for the heart? Okay, y'all help me out here. I can't be the only one that knows this. What's a normal pulse rate? All right, do this. Count your pulse. Look at your watch. Actually, just count it for 30 seconds, and we'll take an average. Got to watch your watch. Okay, got that 30 seconds yet? This is called punishment. You got 30 seconds yet? Some of you are going to make this up. I can already tell. Okay, it's been 30 seconds. Multiply that by 2. So we'll get what it is for a minute. Okay, how many has one that's between 40 and 50? 50 and 60? 60 and 70? 70 and 80? 80 and 90? 90 and 100? Over 100? Okay, good work. So let's say the average, I would have gone with 50 here, but we only had 150. Before we use your number, we're going to go with 50 here. One of you has a good resting heart rate. So our stroke volume, 50 cc's or milliliters if you prefer, time beats per minute, just going to go with 50. What's our cardiac output? about that. It's not 250, is it? Just checking it out. 2,500 cc's. That's our cardiac output. So that's going to be the amount of blood we pump out in a minute. So if your heart rate is 100, if it's 100, yeah, make it easy for you. What's it going to be? That's significantly more, isn't it? Yeah. Now, if you have a pulse, though, of 100, what are the chances, what are the chances that your uh, stroke volume is going to remain the same? Y'all thinking about that, or are you just, like, staring at me? What do you think? Is your... Uh, Stroke volume going to remain the same if it's beating at 100 times a minute? Okay, let's try this. We have an experiment. What, what's our normal respiratory rate just sitting around here? 12. 12. About 12 times a minute. All right, say you started breathing 30 times a minute. Try that for a few minutes. I don't hear anybody breathing except myself. You're breathing faster like that. Are you getting a full, full filling of your lungs? No. So you're not getting the full volume here because you're taking little breaths. Same thing with your heart. It's not able to fill as full if it's going faster. It doesn't have enough time. If it's just going like this, it's got plenty of time to fill. Not a problem. If it's going like this, it doesn't have time to fill as much. So your stroke volume is going to go down, right? That makes sense, doesn't it? Yes. Good. Thank you. That's what I'm looking for. Feedback. Okay, so slowing your heart rate or decreasing the stroke volume, like we were just talking about, is going to decrease your cardiac output. So if, you're, if it's pumping faster, it's going to decrease your volume, which also will decrease your cardiac output. So the point here, when we're looking at pathophysiology, is if you have a patient with a heart rate of 150, what's their cardiac output going to be? Not so good, because the heart doesn't have time to fill. 
So the cardiac output is going to drop. It's going too fast. Can't get that blood in. Can't get that blood out. So it's going to reduce that because there's not enough <coughs> time between each pulse for it to refill. Now you can have other problems with the heart. Mechanical problems. What do you think this would be? It ain't working right. Mechanical problems. It could be somebody stabbed you in the heart. Heart can't do its job if it's got a big knife sticking through it. Can't do its job if somebody's like blown half the tissue away. Those would be mechanical problems. Now sometimes we may have something called a tamponade. Tamponade occurs when you get bleeding around the heart, then the, then the heart can't go like this because it's surrounded by a bunch of blood. Or if you had a bunch of air in the chest that's putting pressure on the heart, it can't go like this because there's too much pressure around there. It basically squeezes the heart. That would be a mechanical issue. You could have a bunch of your cells die. That's never good. We see that in a heart attack. You not get enough oxygen to the tissues, then the tissue <coughs> starts to die. Once it dies, it can't contract. It's dead. It's like trying to contract a cardboard box. It's not going to happen. Now, you could have electrical problems. Remember the other day we were talking about uh, the primary pacemaker of the heart? Remember what that is? The SA node. That's right. If we have problems with the SA node or the AV node, if any of those are not functioning, then the heart's not going to contract. It's just like the light switch. You know, if there's no electricity in there, the light switch doesn't work, lights aren't going to come on. Now here's something you're going to hate, all right? So be ready to hate the VQ match or mismatch, if you will. Huh? Yeah, and I was like, what's the Q? I don't know where they got the Q from. Okay, we know V stands for ventilation. All right, so VQ match. Our pulmonary, cardiopulmonary system has to work together. So if one of those is dysfunctional, it screws the whole function up. So that's what the VQ match is. V is ventilation. If you're not getting enough air in, oxygen in, it throws a monkey wrench into everything. Uh, and if the blood or the heart is not able to circulate blood, it doesn't matter how much oxygen you have in there, right? They have to work together. So that's the VQ match. So with the ventilation, you have if if you're getting enough proper air into the lungs, you got to have enough circulation and blood pressure in order to perfuse the body. Now perfusion, I think we talked about this the other day. What is perfusion? Remember I said this is a definition you have to know? I know you've all been studying, I can tell. Perfusion, somebody give me a hand. Yep, perfusion is the delivery of oxygen and other nice good little goodies to the cells and the removal of waste products, most prominently carbon dioxide. That's perfusion. So in order to have good perfusion, you have to have good oxygen and you gotta have a delivery system. Those two work together. What's the matter? Okay. Do what? You sure? Are y'all talking about food? Yeah. Want some? Okay. All right, so we got to have good ventilation and we got to have good circulation. That leads to good perfusion. So they have to match. So if we talk about a VQ mismatch, V is ventilation, Q, I guess, is circulation. Who thinks of a Q for that? Circulation. Good. Circulation. I like that. So if you have a mismatch, what exactly does that mean? We're either not getting enough what? Oxygen, or we're not getting enough blood flow, right? Covers that pretty good. So if either one of these are out of whack, we're not gonna get this. You may get blood flow to the tissues, but if it doesn't have oxygen in it, how useful is it? Not. So if you get good oxygen, but it can't flow down there because you're so severely dehydrated or you've lost a lot of blood, not going to work. No perfusion. Now, shock. What is shock? Not really. Shock is a result of hypoperfusion. So hypoperfusion means we're not getting enough <laughs> oxygen, and blood, oxygen and blood flow to the tissues. 
as a consequence of that, we go into shock. So perfusion is the regular delivery of oxygen and nutrients to the cells or the removal of waste products. Hypoperfusion means we're not getting enough of that. The patient can die from that. But the result of hypoperfusion is what we call shock. And then we'll talk about <coughs> recognizing shock, which calls for us to recognize when the body's compensated. And we've talked about that. What are going to be the first signs of compensation? I haven't called it those terms. But what's going to be the first signs that you'll see with the patient? that they're having issues there they're trying to make up for. We're in tachycardia. The heart rate's going to increase, right? What else will we see? Increased respiratory rate. Those are our, our main, our most obvious, the first signs of compensation. So the body's trying to fix it before it gets really, really sick. It's kind of like you get exposed to some bacteria. And what does your body do? Da, 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 da. White blood cells and rescue. You know, you remember that from what, third grade? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, as soon as you get a sign of infection, the body's going to ramp up production of white blood cells to fight that infection. That's basically what we're doing here with compensation. The body saying, ooh, not enough oxygen. It's not getting around. Got to fix that. Not enough blood flow. Ooh, got to fix that. How's it going to fix it? It's going to start by tachycardia, increasing the heart rate. It's going to increase the respiratory rate. See if they can fix it. So, so when the body detects that there are issues, the system to the rescue is going to be our sympathetic, NS stands for nervous system, sympathetic nervous system response. For example, if I come over here and I'm not scared of you, you're going to get a sympathetic response because I've scared you. Th that response is what? What's the body do first? Besides turning on. What's the vital sign changes? Tachycardia, increased respiratory rate. So it scared the crap out of you, right? So that's compensatory. All of a sudden your body goes, I need more oxygen because I have to flee. I need greater blood flow so I can get my muscles going. So that's going to be a sympathetic response. I talked about this earlier, sympathetic versus parasympathetic response. I remember it, the body's taking sympathy on me. It feels sorry for me because I have to run away. So it's going to increase my heart rate, increase my respiratory rate. That's going to be a sympathetic nervous system response. So whether it's caused by a disease or an illness or somebody scaring the crap out of you, the response is going to be the same or very similar. Signs of compensation? Oh, look. What do we call this? Starts with a T. Tachycardia. Okay. You know what we call increased respiratory rate? Same stuff, tachapnea. It's pretty weird. Still tachy and P N E A, right? Tachapnea, increased respiratory rate. Your pupils dilate. You know, when you get scared like that, when you get a central, a, a sympathetic nervous system response, the pupils dilate. Why does that happen? It's, it comes from back in the, the caveman days. If I scare the crap out of you like that, you're not going to be reading a book. Usually, when you read a book, your pupils kind of constrict because it's focused right here. If you've got to run away really fast, I want a really wide field of vision so I can see all the other boogie bears that's going to get me, right? So the pupils dilate so you can take in more light, you can see more things, it's going to help you as you flee. So even though you're not fleeing when you're sick, you may get a sympathetic nervous system response, which will include dilated pupils. Your skin gets pale, cool, and clammy, or I call it cool, pale, and diaphoretic. Why does that happen? What's your body doing? What's its response? Part of that sympathetic response, people's dilate, respiratory rate increases, your heart rate increases. How else can your body get your blood pressure up? Vasoconstriction. When you vasoconstrict, it's like when you go outside and it's really cold, the body vasoconstricts. When you get scared or you have a sympathetic response, you're going to vasoconstrict. It's going to make that container smaller so it can get uh, oxygen and blood flow around to the important places, you know, your brain, your lungs, your heart. So you get cool, pale, and diaphoretic. How are we doing so far? Getting close. Okay, other body systems, most of which we don't care too much about, except you do need to understand the fluid balance in the body. Over 60% of our body is just plain old water. 
So if you dehydrate that out, you can lose a lot of weight. You know, yesterday I weighed 150, today I weighed 98. Lost 60% of my body. Of course, I guess that was a, wasn't quite 60%. Okay. 70% of this is going to be intracellular, which means it's actually in the cell, right? 5% is intervascular. That's going to be circulating volume. Interstitial is other fluid that's going to be in the tissues, outside of the vascular system, that kind of thing. Fluid regulation. Your brain tells you when you're thirsty. You know, your mom told you, somebody told you probably. Once you get thirsty, you're past the point of needing fluid. So you really need to be replenishing your fluids on an ongoing basis. Just sitting around doing almost nothing in here, this air conditioning is just going to suck the fluid out of your body. So you need to be constantly replenishing that. Once you feel thirsty, you're past the point and you need to be drinking. Your kidneys are, is the organ that manages uh, the release of fluid from the body. So if your kidneys aren't working well, it can't regulate the fluid loss, then you're going to end up with edema. It's going to be held in the body. It's not going to go anywhere. We talked about the plasma proteins pull fluid into the bloodstream. Cell membranes may be permeable, regulate the flow of fluid in and out. And all this you know is on a cellular level, but you have to kind of understand if you've got a patient that's dehydrated, they've taken a bunch of medications, or they've been outside, or whatever, you need to be able to track it back to see what the, co the cause might be. <coughs> so fluid disruption, you can lose a lot of fluid, makes you dehydrated. You may get an unequal fluid distribution. That means you may get an accumulation of fluid in places that you don't want it, which would be the worst place where I don't want it to accumulate. Probably my lungs. Yeah, I don't want it in my lungs. I definitely don't want it in my brain. So edema is going to be the accumulation of that fluid somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Good for me. All right, the nervous system. The brain and the spinal cord, as we said, what do we call that nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord? The central nervous system, that's right. What do we call the other nervous system? Peripheral nervous system, that's everything else. So the brain and spinal cord are fairly well protected. Um, did we do this last night about the brain and the cranium and the layers of the brain? Did that in the morning class. All right, so the brain uh, is covered by several layers, protective layers, and each layer has a different function that it's supposed to do, but it protects the brain. And it's like a, a layer of bone, and then it's a layer of tissue, and then a, you know, a little vascular layer in here, and then another little layer. And surrounding your brain is going to be cerebral spinal fluid. So the cerebral spinal fluid flows, of course, up and down your spinal column, but the cerebral part means it also circulates around your brain. So anything that interferes with that free flow through the brain and the spinal cord usually is going to back up into the brain and cause swelling in the brain, which is then would be a nervous system disorder. We see this most commonly from trauma, but we also see it with certain diseases. Can you think of any illness that you hear that people get that can lead to uh, too much cerebral spinal fluid or swelling to the brain tissue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, meningitis. You know, does that look familiar here? Meninges. That's going to be an inflammation that occurs within the layers of the brain, the meninges. So that's never good either. Okay, we can have a disruption of the central nervous system through trauma. You know, penetrating head injury, gunshot wound, knife. Anything that damages the spine, if when the brain tissue swells, you know, we've got a closed box. The cranium is closed except for, you know, a couple little spaces. So if the brain starts to swell, we're going to have some serious problems there. But trauma is a very common cause of that. Medical causes, if a patient has a stroke or an aneurysm that bursts and it bleeds in the brain, it's going to cause a lot of swelling in the brain tissue. It's going to interrupt the nervous system. We mentioned infection. Encephalitis, uh, get bit, get stung by a nasty old, uh, what do you call those things, mosquitoes, or if you get meningitis. Uh, something like Lou Gehrig's disease or muscular sclerosis, those are nervous system dysfunctions. Low blood sugar, hypoglycemia, that has a major impact on the nervous system, as does hypoxia. 
Okay, the endocrine system, we have glands that secrete hormones. And hormones are very important. It's not just male and female hormones, but the other hormones. For instance, uh, insulin is a hormone that's secreted by the body. And insulin is extremely important to us being able to uh, metabolize the glucose in the body. So it's important. Uh, endocrine system, the endocrine uh, hormones have a major effect on the brains, the kidneys, pancreas, pituitary. All of these either use or create uh, hormones. Uh, I'm going to have to read about this. You're going to have to read about hypothyroidism and hypothyroidism. I just can't do it. If we don't have enough uh, hormones, specifically, what hormone regulates diabetes? Insulin. So we don't have enough insulin, we're going to have a problem with diabetes. And we'll talk about that at length when we get to that chapter. Digestive. Probably the biggest problem we're going to have, or that we're going to see with digestive system disorders, is going to be if you have a patient with a gastrointestinal bleed where it may be a small bleed from the intestines, they're losing a small amount of blood over a long period of time, or they can have a major blood loss through a GI bleed. And so we'll see uh, patients with those issues. And of course, if we have, uh, you know, if they're severely dehydrated, that causes uh, dig digestive system problems. If a patient has a lot of vomiting and diarrhea, that's a digestive system, system problem, but that also is gonna lead to shock, right? Because of low circulating blood volume. If you, if you lose a lot of fluid, a lot of plasma, a lot of fluid in the body, it's going to drop your blood pressure, of course. Okay. How are we doing so far? Can't go into this right now. Just can't do it. We'll talk about that stuff when we get to each body system and what's going on with it. Okay, so we know what pathophysiology... Don't leave yet. Okay, it's not 9 o'clock. We can always say till 9. Like last night. Sorry. Um... Pathophysiology is what? Disease process, right. disease of the body. That's right. Pathophysiology helps us to recognize disease processes in the body. When we see signs and symptoms, we may be able to figure out the cause of those. That's important. Okay, we have to recognize shock immediately or suspect shock immediately. What is the pathophysiology of shock? I already told you guys this. What causes shock? Hypoperfusion. Hypoperfusion will cause shock. So they're not interchangeable. The result of hypoperfusion is shock, okay? All right. Shock occurs when the regular delivery of oxygen nutrients and the removal of which is interrupted. If we don't have a regular supply of oxygen, what type of metabolism occurs? not hypoxic metabolism, anaerobic. anaerobic. If you can read, you can get this right. I'm helping you out here. Anaerobic metabolism. So aerobic metabolism, how much energy is created in the normal good, uh, excuse me, I said anaerobic, I mean aerobic, in aerobic metabolism? How much energy? 36 moles. How much with anaerobic? Yeah, so it's not a good exchange. Okay. You're treating a patient who was recently released from the ICU with a massive infection, sepsis. Never good. This has impaired the patient's ability to regulate the size of the blood vessels. Remember we talked about that, that permeability issue? How will this affect the patient's ability to compensate for any additional illnesses? You can't regulate the vascular system, right? He's sick. Is this going to, how does this impact his ability to fight off infection. Yeah, he's already sick. He's already compromised. So it's going to leave him much more vulnerable to other things. The patient's sepsis will affect the body's ability to dilate constricted blood vessels so it can no longer regulate blood pressure, which can be a problem. Ta da! Okay, this is football weekend. Enjoy your weekend, but also study. You've got Monday off. Please be safe. Monday afternoon, 2.30, down the hall is going to be your orientation, clinical orientation. We're going to test at 5. Did I forget something? Okay, y'all be safe. I will see you on Tuesday.